Welcome to this presentation, which we have entitled, There is an I in AI. My name is Matt Wicks, and I am the co-CEO responsible for technology and innovation at the Virtual Forge. What that means is I'm an AI fanboy. Um, and one of the things that everybody's discussing at the moment is the fact that AI is out there. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? What does it mean? Are jobs going to disappear? Is the world going to disappear? And we want to address a few of those topics in this conversation with you. So fear the AI for the world is doomed. This is the attitude that I think a lot of people have at the moment. There is a slight panic about it, um, as well as a kind of growing excitement around AI. So perhaps one of the best things to do is to talk about the story of Tay and how Tay tweeted um, uh, in, in the past. So Tay was a, an automatic um, chatbot that was, created by, uh, that was created by Microsoft and was put onto Twitter. And the aim was to see if an automated chatbot could grow and learn from the content that was out there. So Tay was put live and uh, started to tweet and people were interacting with Tay over a period of time. And this was quite successful for the first couple of hours. The vocabulary grew, the knowledge grew, the expressions grew. But then, as I think everybody would expect who has been on Twitter for any period of time, when you're growing and gaining your knowledge from that corpus of, of uh, variable information that's out there, over time, Tay began to push out... Uh, uh, over time, Tay began to respond in a racist and offensive way um, so that within only a handful of hours since she was launched she was then decommissioned and turned off because of the uh, the, the racist and violent tweets that she was uh, she was putting out and i think that's a, a very good example like i said this is this is not the state of the art today this is a few years ago but this is a very good example of the risks that people see um, in in terms of ai so what does this actually tell us? Um, you know, it tells us that Twitter is a sad reflection of humanity. Um, it tells us that uh, AI learns from its environment. So, you know, the, the, there is no great surprise that if you take a range of information and some of that uh, outlying information is quite extreme, that that information will be used as the basis for creating input, which is exactly what happened and exactly how uh, the, the, the content was created in that way. And then once you start to respond to that information, in a way, it will look for other patterns of where people have responded to that information in the same way. And so the cycle starts to propagate and the racist information gets fed back with offensive uh, responses, which then, when it maps to the corpus of information that's been brought in, becomes more offensive and so on. Okay. Um, it's also important that uh, what we put into AI uh, is important to, to, to what we put into the AI model is what drives the output of the AI model. So, you know, it's not that something random was putting that information into the model. The model, as in the background and knowledge that had come from the Twitter uh, tweets that had been around before, was what was driving that. That information was created by, largely, by real people as well in the first place. Which, which tells us that there is an I in AI. Ultimately, you know, the, the, the machine, the tool, Tay, it's only responding in the way that we have taught it to respond. And that's exactly what the, the, the challenges and the responsibility of AI give us uh, for the future. And in many ways, you know, whilst we as technologists might get very, very excited about AI and the possibilities of AI and generative AI and so on, the reality is that the responsibilities and the ethics behind it is something that is lagging far, far behind. However, there is an enormous amount of, um, of, of excitement in there. So how can people impact the output? How can we actually um, generate and control the output? Obviously, you know, we're, we're not talking on this, this speech about the, the new legislations that the EU is bringing in around guidance and governance. We're talking about, on a practical level, how do we input into, uh, into our interactions with AIs? So one of the, one of the best um, analogies that, that I've heard is that um, an AI is a tractor. So what I mean by this is if you take a look at um, the, the, the evolution of farm machinery and the evolution of uh, people working in the fields, 
Everybody was very anxious and nervous about the development of a tractor because it was going to take people's jobs and, and control things and so on. And all right, it's, it's on a different scale, but fundamentally, you know, the, the, um, the, the use of a tractor allowed a farmer or farmers to, for, for them to be 200% or so more efficient in what they were doing at the, end of the, at the end of the process. It was a tool that they governed, that they could turn on and off, and that they had the control to be able to, to manage. And in many ways, an AI is just the tractor here. If we take an example here, this picture on the left-hand side was generated by, by the AI DALI 2 um, and was given a very simple prompt of a robot driving a tractor in, in a field of wheat. Um, and from that, it created this drawing. But it couldn't have created anything if I had not given it the prompt. It couldn't have created anything if it did not have this massive background of information that had been trained by human beings in order to be able to generate that, uh, that, that image as well. Okay. Um, and you know, this is, this is a, another example of using exactly the same thing. You know, so we've asked here for a lifelike image of a tractor driving a, a, a track of a robot driving a tractor in a field of wheat. Now, arguably, this is not a lifelike image. So therefore, we need to refine and understand where is the misunderstanding between what I'm asking for and what it's delivering. Is this within a 10, 15 percent view of what I think is, is what I'm looking for? Or is it something completely different? You know, and by being able to refine that, we improve the model and we improve the results that we get. But we are driving that model. You know, to give it an extreme example, I could go through and label every tractor in the model that I'm building as a banana, and then it would start to draw me pictures of bananas in fields because the input that I gave it was completely wrong. Here we go, one more example. An image of a robot driving a tractor in a field of wheat um, by uh, toulouse Lautrec. So taking that style, we're being much more specific about what we're doing, but, but by being more specific, we're also controlling much more the output that we're getting um, in there. So a large number of tools that are around which allow us to, uh, to see. One of the ones I really want to highlight here is the generative AI tool of Adobe Firefly, which has just been uh, released, which basically allows artists and creative people to be able to stimulate and design content by interacting with it. It's, it's an AI that's built, that's going to be built into to Adobe's tool sets and so on. And literally, as you've seen from this video here, allows you to create and design and, and, and draw images but based on your input, it's simply a tool, like Photoshop is a tool, to augment the work that, that you're doing and still becomes, okay. And I, an, AI, an AI is also a teacher. It allows you to automate uh, tedious tasks as well. So um, it allows you to take tasks such as um, generating questions for an exam, uh, and to be able to create those questions at the flick of a button. It allows you, as you'll see in this video, uh, it shows you the, the, um, the generation of content based upon, in this case, a Wikipedia page. So an AI is also a guide. It allows you to put face to content. So in this example here, um, you can see that what we have here is an AI-generated avatar speaking content that has been written by me. Now, obviously, the content could also be written, um, as you would as you would expect, the content could also be written by a, another AI. But ultimately, at some point in the in the in the process, a human being is responsible for the model that has been created, and a human being is responsible for the oversight of that model, and a human being is responsible for the designs and creation that have gone into the creation of that content, how it gets deployed, how it gets integrated, and how it gets utilized. So I'll pause a bit here for, to, to play this video for you. Hey, it is great to be here at Learning Technologies. Thanks for inviting me, Matt. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about why we really do need the AI and AI. Here are a couple of examples. AI can be used to generate financial reports, but it is important for humans to validate the accuracy of the numbers before they are released to investors. AI can be used to generate legal documents, but it is important for humans to validate the documents before they are filed with the court. Okay, Matt, back to you. Likewise, there are all sorts of um, there are all sorts of AIs that are out there which allow you to generate real-sounding voice content. 
Um, and once again, you know, this is all based on human interactions. It's all based on people studying stress patterns, and it's all based on models that are created and content that is created by, uh, by people. Um, there are challenges in this area. I'm sure everybody's heard about the, um, the faking of, of Steve Jobs' voice, the faking of Donald Trump's voice, the, fake, the faking of um, all sorts of voices to be able to create fake content. Um, and, and that's an issue that, that for sure needs to be managed in terms of ethics, availability, autonomy, and, and management. But the, the core thing is, even bad actors are creating the content. There's still a person in that process choosing to create the bad content at that point. So the conclusion really here is that AI needs us. You know, for, for news articles, for example, um, AI can be, can be used to generate news articles but it's important for humans to validate the accuracy of the, of the news articles that are being created. The BBC has introduced their, their new validation service as an example of this. You know, with, with the, we, we all know kind of pre-AI with, with the preponderance of deep fakes, with the preponderance of fake news, with the preponderance of you know, misleading information and um, the, the, the ability to be able to do that at scale, the, the, the requirement for successful deployment of of artificial intelligence in the future is on both sides of the equation. It's on the content creation and it's also on the validation and management side of it. And I think that's going to become much more important over, over, over time. Financial reports, for example. AI can be used to generate financial reports, but it's important that these are uh, the accuracy of these is understood by humans. Um, it's important that people are there to validate and sign off of those processes, just as in a modern world, if you do agree with a financial regulation or, or you sign up on a financial contract, at some point in most, most arrangements, you have to have a person involved in there to give you financial advice. A medical diagnosis. This is an area where there have been fantastic advances and, and AI is being seen as a huge, huge benefit. The speed at which it can analyze massive data and draw conclusions, uh, the, the speed at which it's developing new vaccines, the speed at which it's being able to uh, apply, um, the, it, the speed at which it's being able to uh, increase the speed of um, cancer diagnosis and, and so on. All of those things are undoubtedly great and beneficial, but the information for all of those has been generated and created and curated and labeled by people. And ultimately, the responsibility for that and the acceptance of that and the actions that come off the back of that will need to be managed and controlled and validated by people as well. Legal documents. There's a lot of work on legal tech. It's one of the, uh, one of the areas of industry that's being most commonly um, changed at the moment by technology. You know, but once again, it requires content to be created, labeled and, and created by people, content to be validated and output by people at the end of that process, and creative content. So as I, as I mentioned earlier on, all of this, you know, there, there are amazing pieces of content that can be created. People have been creating films online. There's, there's the amazing, um, there are lots of amazing companies, especially Coke, for example, who are doing extraordinary things with, um, with AI to create their content. But the source of all this is creativity that's been input by people in the first place. The output and the tweaking of it is all being done by creative people at the outcome of it as well. We just need to work out how AI can fit into our place and how, how AI can be used and governed. It's in all of our tools nowadays. So for example, um, this is an example of Power BI, one of Microsoft's most popular tools where it has now got um, artificial intelligence built into it to allow um, the system to draw conclusions from the charts and so on that are being put in. But like anything else, and, and we say this a lot in technology, garbage in, garbage out, you need to be able to validate that that information is correct and you need to be able to help it grow and understand that the conclusions it's drawing are, are accurate. Obviously, over time, by making it more accurate, those conclusions will become less requiring people to intervene and more accurate over time. But, but you know, at the moment, AI is like a, a child. It's a sponge absorbing everything. And you have to help it draw conclusions over the many years to come to be able to, to get it to be as valid and, and useful as it could be. You know, and one of the other things is, you know, what I always call getting, getting the tractor into your field. So this is an example of image recognition. This is an AI tool that's been available from AWS for you know, five or six years now where you can input an image and it will recognize all the artifacts in the image. 
uh, such as a skateboard and so on, or you can put in a face and it will tell you the expression that it thinks that face has, where the face is, um, and you know what else is happening in there, what's the mood of the person according to the face. It can recognize certain people, it can match faces to faces, so it can help you identify facial recognition, been around for more than 15 years and so on. But the reality is, in order to make, be able to use it, you have to get the tractor into your field. You have to teach it what you want to do. So a great use of image recognition during the COVID crisis was people training it to recognize PPI uh, clothes. So training it to recognize this is a mask, these are gloves. People are properly attired to be able to go into this environment. Here's, a, here's an area where that, uh, that quarantine has been compromised as a, as a result of that. You know, and a lot of the tools that are coming out now, a lot of the tools are allowing people to, for example, highlight the content that is specific to their business and be able to drive image recognition for that. So in this example here from Amazon, again, you can take pictures of a motherboard, you can isolate specific components, and you can say, okay, take a look at these million photographs of motherboards, and these are our components that we want you to recognize, but they are specific to us. So once again, you have an AI tool, AWS recognition, been around for a long time, but by training it and personalizing it to your business case, you're able to deliver value, but also keep your data within your own, uh, in your own space. And, and effectively, to squeeze the analogy as far as I can, the tractor is now in your field. So in terms of learning and in terms of education, um, AI is just, I think, a part of the progress. We started out with instructor-led training. We became very involved in collaborative learning, people working together in small teams of people. Social learning became a very big thing with the rise of social networks and the ability to create and share small pieces of content with valid pieces of information. But the challenge there has always been finding that and linking pieces together. And AI is the tool that allows you to take the, the, the content from, uh, from YouTube, from TikTok, from, from LinkedIn, from Facebook, to be able to link it all in and try to make sense of it in a coherent way that is designed to be personalized for you, but always with oversight from, uh, from people. So what skills do we need to make the most of this? Um, so there are lots of different elements that are needed to make the most of, of AI. It's not simply a one-stop shop you can just take off the shelf. Of course you can for experimentation and so on, but to roll it out in a proper, efficient, effective way for uh, learning or, or business process, you need to be able to integrate into your systems. You need to be able to really understand the security because you don't want to be passing your client data onto an unknown company or a known company in the sky. You need to have proper proper management around that. You need to have AI data management to make to manage where the uh, if the AI gives you wrong information, how do you feed that back into retraining it? If you have new products and new content being loaded up all the time, how do you label that content to be able to to get it to work uh, really well? You need to have AI validation, which is a team of people being able to validate the the output of the AI and raise any concerns. Uh, and you need to have AI real-world interfaces. So, you know, at the moment, everybody is very excited by the simplicity of the prompt, but really people want to be able to go to the next stage, which is, you know, how do I get this into my application? How do I get, how do I, how do I use my speaker, my, my smart speaker to talk to it? How do I use, you know, touch-sensitive devices, AR goggles, all of those things to be able to interact with it in a seamless way so I don't feel like I'm suddenly dealing with another piece of, of computerized hardware. That's the area that we work in. That's the area we're very interested in. We're very happy to speak to anybody about any of these things in, in, uh, in detail. Um, so if you are interested in getting in touch with us, please do get in touch at the, uh, at the addresses below um, or reach out to us on uh, Twitter. We're also very happy to, to speak to you. Thank you for listening.